Better. Good morning. morning. Thanks. It's my pleasure to welcome you. Um, I'm Jenna McKeel, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Google Demo Day, featuring startups from across the Americas. Google for Entrepreneurs is Google's global outreach effort to support startup communities and help startups grow so they can continue to be engines of progress. And we do this in two ways. First, through partnerships, we can scale our efforts to support startup communities around the world. And we have over 50 partners, uh, ranging from tech hubs to accelerators to diversity organizations to education groups. We also op uh, operate our own startup spaces. And we have six spaces around the world in London, Tel Aviv, Seoul, Sao Paulo, Warsaw, and Madrid. And the 11 startups you'll he hear from today represent organizations across the Google for Entrepreneurs network. Globally, startups in the Google for Entrepreneurs network have created 44,000 jobs and raised over 5.1 billion in funding in 2017. And we're excited to increase those numbers in 2018. We have almost 100 people in the audience here today, and we're live streaming the event to tens of thousands of people around the world. We're thrilled to have a broad range of investors here. We have over 50 funds represented, and we, the funds that are here provide seed stage through Series B funding. To get today started, I'd like to introduce Bradley Horowitz, our VP of Product and leading Google for Entrepreneurs, who's going to talk about Google's work with startups. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, it's so great to be with you here today. I want to welcome everyone, the entrepreneurs, the investors, the judges, the Googlers. Thank you all for coming. We're going to have a great morning together. So as many of you know, Google's mission is to make information universally available and useful. And the word that jumps out for me there is universally. We're going to start with the earth, but we mean it. We're going to start with the earth. You, you heard a little bit about the global reach and the global scale, and we take that very, very seriously, that innovation and entrepreneurial efforts should extend beyond Silicon Valley, beyond the United States, really to the whole earth. And we at Google for Entrepreneurs aim to be a convener, bringing people together, bringing together and doing this matchmaking, investors, startup founders. We want to help create spaces, communities, where we can actually connect people to each other. And today, you'll see 11 fantastic startups that span the Americas, from places like McKinney, Texas, all the way to Buenos Aires, Argentina. And we brought strong investors here, too, so that they can actually help make that connection and move on to the next phase of their journey. We know that when they're successful, they don't only build great products which change people's lives, but the economic impact is real, too. They go on to hire more and more people to grow and become formidable uh, economic forces in their own right. And that's also some of the opportunity that we bring to the world. So slide, please. Uh, since we started Demo Day in 2014, startups have gone to raise almost a quarter billion dollars. These are just Demo Day startups. You saw the numbers for Google for entrepreneurs more broadly. Just from Demo Day startups, almost a quarter billion dollars. And 10 companies have gone on to be acquired. In fact, Split, which is a Detroit-based ride-sharing startup, shout out for Detroit, my hometown, uh, was on this stage two years ago uh, and they were nominated by Grand Circus, and they were just acquired this month by a German company who attended Demo Day. So really happy to see that full circle play out. Um, what we do here is we take a one Google approach toward how we support startups. And Google is a big company now, and we have a lot of different efforts that focus on startups. Uh, and many of those folks are here and represented in the audience today. And uh, I want to call out a few teams. GV, formerly Google Ventures, Gradient Ventures, a new fund that we've created focusing on AI and machine learning focused startups, Sand Hill, corporate development. They're all here and we help you navigate Google and get the most out of that relationship. So in terms of the scope today, you'll be hearing uh, some very well curated companies that span things like AR, VR, all the way to ag tech, agriculture technology. 
these companies all have significant traction, they have solid teams, and they're taking on really big challenges. And Jenna will go over the specific criteria of how they were selected and how the judges will be thinking about them. Uh, but we're really excited to have such a diverse group of founders here with us today. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to all the teams that supported this event, and I've been to many, many hack days, and these things don't just magically come together. There are many little people behind the scenes who make this as well run and great, and I want to call out a few of them. I mentioned GV, Gradient Ventures. There's the Demo Day alumni who've been helping, people who've been up on this stage before that are helping the next generation uh, be successful. Our corporate development team at Google, Kapor Capital, 500 startups, those are two fantastic Google for Entrepreneur partners, but they've been very, very generous in helping coach the teams, polish their pitches to make sure that their time up on this stage is well spent and perfectly conveys their, their vision and mission. So I'm as excited as you are to hear uh, from these great startups. And so with that, I wanna hand it back to Jenna to kick things off. Thanks, Bradley. We're always experimenting to find new ways to help startups in our network connect with investors and raise funding. And this year, we focused on a strong program to do just that. Over the past few weeks, startups have been meeting with GV one-on-one -on -one to get feedback on their pitches and connecting with agency experts on their actual pitch decks. This week, um, over the past few days, the founders have connected and prepared together. They have met with a panel of investors and they've connected with acquired founders at Google. Now, I wanna welcome our panel of judges. First, we'll start with Diane Eisner. Uh, Diane works across users, governments, international media, and local community groups to spearhead ways as global initiatives to make connected cities a reality. She's an active angel investor and is the co-founder of Neighborhood Start Fund with a fellow judge here today we will introduce in a minute. Now, Wasilu Mohamed Jacko would like to welcome you. Wasilu is better known by his stage name, Lupe Fiasco. He's a Chicago-born, Grammy award-winning, American rapper, record producer, and entrepreneur. He's the co-founder of the Neighborhood Start Fund with Diane and encourages disenfranchised youths to develop entrepreneurial skills to establish a business in underserved communities. Next, I want to welcome Monique Woodard. Monique is an early stage investor at the intersection of technology and newly powerful consumer groups. Her investments as an angel investor and venture partner at 500 startups include Blavity, Silvernest, Mented, Printivo, and many others. Monique is the co-founder of Black Founders and has a, had a career across mobile, media, online retail, and government technology. And finally, I want to welcome JD Vance. JD is an investor a commentator, and a best-selling author of Hillbilly Elegy. He served as a principal of the leading Silicon Valley venture capital firm, Mitchell Capital, co-founded by Peter Thiel. He recently became a partner at Revolution to work on Rise of the Rest, which is Revolution's effort to work closely with entrepreneurs in emerging startup ecosystems. So let's give our judges a round of applause. Thank you. And now for the startups. The teams you're about to hear from come from Canada, the US, Mexico, and Argentina. And they span many verticals, as Bradley mentioned, from AI to healthcare to fintech to robotics. You'll hear directly from the partners later this morning who nominated these fantastic partners. So I'd like to give a shout out also to all of the watch parties who are watching over the live stream around the world. Uh, we may miss a few, but hopefully we'll get there. But Aria Trace in Buenos Aires, we have Talent Garden in Milan, Rome, and Turin. We have American Underground in Durham. We have Communitech in Waterloo, Ontario. We have Fuel Collective, or formerly known as COCO, in Minneapolis. We have Notman House in Montreal, Quebec. And we have Google offices across the Americas tuned in to support these startups today. So quickly, I want to give you a little bit more insight into the selection criteria. So startups that were nominated by partners had to be incorporated and headquartered in uh, North America or South America. They have to raise at least $100,000, be actively raising one to five million within six months of this event, and have demonstrated traction through customer growth, revenue, et cetera. 
And the Google teams that selected these 11 finalists today looked at strength of team, execution and traction, and their growth potential. So the judges here today will be using those criteria when they're selecting the judge's favorite. And finally, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the format, and then we'll get started. So we have 11 startups here today. Each will pitch for four minutes. And if a pitch goes long over the four minutes, a gong will sound. Um, founders will then have three minutes to have Q&A from the judges panel. And at the end of the event, the judges will crown the judges' favorite. So while the judges deliberate, we'll invite the audience here and on the live stream to vote for the Audience Choice Award. And that's the startup they believe has the greatest potential to impact their industry. And we'll give you directions on that later on, how to do so. Please follow along and join hashtag Google Demo Day. Help shout out for these startups who are here from all across the, the region. And after the pitches, we'll have a networking lunch across the hall where you checked in. So don't leave, come join us. And we'll have booths for the startups. So you can sit, have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them, learn more. And you can connect with the startups directly to schedule a meeting with them. They'll be here in the building until 3 PM. But if you don't have time and you have to run out, drop your business card in an envelope at their booth if you want to chat with them. And I'm sure they will follow up with your, with your business card. Um, so with that, all the way from Durham, North Carolina, please welcome Ivana from Fathom. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Ivana Dumanyan and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Fathom. My partner and I were both NCAA Division I athletes at Duke University who suffered major injuries both through our high school and collegiate careers. The two of us, a couple of years ago, came together and decided to bring our engineering and data science talents together to solve a problem that we fundamentally care about, athletic injury. Nearly one in 30 kids will experience a catastrophic injury before they even graduate high school. These are injuries like ACL tears and, and Achilles tears. And what's worse, nearly one third of those kids, excuse me, two thirds of those kids will suffer long-term effects long after their injury is healed. Things like osteoarthritis, depression, eating disorders. The good news is that preventative personalized treatment has been extremely effective in mitigating or completely preventing uh, uh, those injuries from happening in the first place. Nearly 70% actually. But the last big hurdle is cost. Today this process requires a heavy investment in equipment, massive and extremely expensive technologies to actually measure and survey an individual's biomechanics. With that, it then requires a specialized expert to interpret that data and take that all the way to something that you and I can use, a training regimen. Well, for the past three years, we've been working with institutions, with researchers at Duke University and UNC to take simple, inexpensive sensors and replicate not only the capabilities of these multi-hundred thousand dollar devices, but the accuracy as well. We've automated the processing and we've used techniques like artificial intelligence and others to take proprietary data and research findings and turn that into an actionable training recommendation in the palm of your hand through our mobile app. And the best part about it is nearly a hundredth of the cost of conventional uh, measures. Today, our subscription comes in two fun flavors, a single sensor solution that can be worn right on the small of the back to manage and, and, and mitigate over training risk and fatigue, and a more sophisticated three sensor solution with two additional devices worn on the inside of each heel. With that, we're capable of monitoring your biomechanics in high resolution as you train and play, identifying which activities you're doing great in and which exercises you're maybe not ready for. With that, we can come and uh, provide a highly tailored, personalized recommendation to you. How to train, what exercises you're ready for, which ones you're not, what to do next. Uh, this is the stellar team that makes it all happen. Uh, today, we're eight full-time engineers, um, with three of us having PhDs and, and backgrounds in artificial intelligence and embedded engineering and, and physical therapy. But most importantly, 90% of us 
are former athletes who've personally experienced the pain of athletic injury. We're currently hiring for sales and marketing roles on our team to help us grow our reach within our initial market. If you're interested, please send us an email at careers at fathomai.com. <laughs> Uh, right now, we serve primarily competitive amateur field and court sports, youth athletes predominantly. And it's been about two months since we launched our, uh, soft launched our product, and we've been able to close a little over $160,000 in annual signups. Over the next year, we're anticipating, we're on a trajectory to hit about a $2.2 .2 million run rate, and we're excited to introduce features that can help us spread from helping just these kids into their nuclear family through features specifically for runners and boutique gym goers. I'm out of time. <laughs> okay. um, we're uh, currently uh, raising a $2 million round led by Freestyle. Um, we have a 90% uh, filled that round, um, but we're accepting one new investor uh, uh, to join our family. And if you're interested, we'd really love to come and see you in the back after this event. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, great, great pitch. So, how do you get? How do you ensure that people want to use this product before it's too late? Because it occurs to me that you may not know that you're training poorly until you actually get an injury. At which mm -hmm. point, the product isn't especially useful anymore. So, how do you get to people before they really need it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's one of the big reasons that we've actually gone directly to youth athletics. Um, by the time that we get to these 12 to 16 year olds that are using our system, the majority of, of our users have either had a friend, a sibling, a teammate who has very graphically experienced a catastrophic injury in front of them. Uh, in the youth athletic space, it's something that's top of mind for most people, especially in the most competitive le uh, levels. Mm -hmm. Um, two questions. Uh, was the woman on the soccer field, was she actually injured or was she flopping how soccer players do? <laughs> uh, I can't comment on that right now. Um, and then the other piece is, is, is how, you know, how much, how much of these injuries are actually due to kind of like lack of preparation, what have you, stretching, which is somewhat arbitrary in, in, in itself. How much of it is actually due to like catastrophic accidents? Mm -hmm things that happen on the field where even if you were wearing this, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't take yeah. into consideration. About 30% of injuries that happen in sports are because of an impact. I clash with someone or I tackled someone or I hit a tree. Um, but the rest are, are pretty much injuries that happen because of overtraining or uh, the fundamental uh, lack of readiness for the movement that, and the conditions that you're training to or under. Um, Ivana, thanks for going first. Um, <laughs> do you have any data on program compliance? I see a lot of the problem with some wearables is that people start using them, and then at some point they drop. There's a drop off. There's a sharp drop off. So how many get and adhere to the training regimen over time? Mm -hmm. So our users use our system on average four times a week. And uh, that varies a little bit based on if it's basketball or, or soccer. But the system has been really impactful in that it doesn't just measure and give you a stat. It measures and gives you an insight into your actual body, what you did well, where you didn't go well, are you improving over time, and gives you a, a specific recommendation on, on what to do. That little tangible, trackable tidbit and, and improvement has been something that we've seen a lot of athletes respond very well to. Um, what, we've, what that's actually spurred is a transition from a just pure hardware sale to a subscription a service, which has actually, our, our market has responded well to because we do a continuous value generation for our users as they continue to use the product. Mm -hmm. will, will these devices, is there thoughts or plans in terms of expansion of it? of these, these sensors delivering information to the actual machines that people are using to kind of like, hey, slow down the treadmill, he's about to break his ankle kind of thing? That's a very interesting concept. We, we've heard um, uh, or s seen opportunities to do that. Um, we'll see what happens in the future. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ivana. And now from Guadalajara, please welcome Jose Luis from UNIMA.
Hello everyone, my name is Jose Luis Nuño. I am CEO and founder of UNIMA. We created a fast and low-cost diagnostic and disease surveillance technology. Current diagnostic technologies can detect almost any disease known with very high levels of accuracy. But the problem is that these are expensive and require specialized equipment and personnel which are very scarce in low resource settings. Our goal is to solve the problem of lack of access to a timely diagnostic for 3 billion people living in the developing world or in low-resource settings in high-income countries. Our technology allows people, even with no technical training, to diagnose a disease directly where the patient is without the use of any lab equipment, with results in 15 minutes and at $1 per test. This technology is very easy to use. You just have to take a drop of blood from a finger prick, then you put it in a paper microfluidic device, you wait 10 minutes, and then you take a picture with an app in your smartphone that will give the result in just five seconds. Then this result, along with contextual information like geolocation, date, and time, is sent to a cloud server, and we can use it for real-time disease surveillance and to create real-time analytics that helps governments and health organizations to create better strategies to stop disease outbreaks and pandemics. This technology is based in a protein that we can modify using genetic engineering to catch biomarkers specific for each one of the diseases. Then we print this protein on the paper device and when it gets in contact with the blood from an infected patient, it creates a visual reaction. And this visual reaction is evaluated in the app by using image analysis processes and neural network algorithms to give you a very accurate result. We are targeting four main market segments. In our first stage, we are targeting the global health market, where users are international health organizations and health NGOs, and where the barriers of entrance are very low because there's a huge need in this market. And the private health market, which includes global pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, and pharmacy chains. In a second stage, we are targeting the animal health market, where users are livestock producers. And in a third uh, stage, it will be the public health market, governments through the national health systems, mostly in the developing world. Right now, we have a set of six key early users, which include global pharmaceutical companies and international health organizations. With these key early users, we are going to roll out the technology in the following five years in regions like Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, China, and India. We are a second time founder team, and together we previously developed another health technology which was commercialized in 14 countries, and so we have proven experience in the development, regulatory process, manufacturing, and commercialization of these kind of technologies. We have been also been supported by great organizations like the Google Developers Launchpad, Y Combinator, um, Endeavor, and Mass Challenge. Currently, our first product for the diagnostic of tuberculosis and HIV already went through clinical trials and is in regulatory process. And we already developed new tests for diabetes, anemia, and poultry health diseases. And we are developing new tests for dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and influenza. As I mentioned, we have a set of six yearly users, but in the pipeline, we have another two of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies of the world and health organizations in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and South Africa. And it's very important to consider that in the next quarter, we will be raising a 7 million Series A. In UNIMA, we have a very, very big goal to secure everyone a timely diagnostic, regardless where you live or your ability to pay. Thank you. Very exciting. Um, you mentioned what is your five-year plan. Given that it is such a competitive space and there is so much complexity around regulations, yep. et cetera, what's your six-month or one-year uh, milestone? What do you think you can pull off fast to kind of go out strong in the market? Okay. Uh, in the following six months, uh, the goal is roll out the first application for animal health in Mexico and Central America. And one year is the launch of the tuberculosis HIV test in Mexico and at least two countries in Africa. Is, is it a family business? <laughs> well, we are, the founders, we are family, yes. Uh, we are three brothers, and actually Laura is my wife. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> 
So when you think about distribution across the human test versus the animal test, is it, aren't those distribution channels markedly different? And how do you plan to kind of go after and dominate in both of those categories mm -hmm. pretty much simultaneously? Yeah. The human health market normally is a bit more complex because even if we are working with a pharma company, this pharma company have like sub uh, distributors in each parts of the world, in regions or countries. The animal health market is a bit different because what we are doing is what we're working with a global pharma company in animal health, which sells directly to large livestock producers. So we sell to this company and this company resells the product directly to the to this company. So actually we are not building like a different business model for the animal health and for human health. It's just like an expansion market. How effective is the diagnostic technology? So you, I think you said you had six early users, but what's your sense for what's a good false positive number? What's a good false negative number? How effective does the tech okay. have to be for it to be useful? For example, the tuberculosis HIV test that we already finished and went through trials has an accuracy of 96% for tuberculosis and 98.5% for HIV. As a reference, for example, the screening test for tuberculosis in endemic countries is around 50 to 60%, and for HIV, a normal lab test, it's around 90 to 99%. So our test can be as good or even better than current lab tests. And why is that? Can you just talk just a little bit more about the tech and why you guys yeah. get so much better numbers? Yeah, a, a first important thing is that we are using more than one biomarker. So for example, for, for TB, we're using three biomarkers. And even by statistics, this increases the possibility of actually catching those cases that are outside of the traditional uh, bell. So we are catching, for example, very early and very late cases. The second one is the same uh, the design of the device increases uh, like the reaction speed between the biomarker or, or protein. So we have a very fast result and we can actually uh, decrease the amount of uh, blood that we need and uh, an antibody that we need. And that way, for example, even in very low concentration, we can actually catch diseases. So it's a matter of design and at the same time, of course, of how that we work with the bioreactor, which is the paper strip. Thank you. Great. And now from McKinney, Texas, please welcome Courtney from Shearshare. Forty <laughs> percent of salon and barbershop space goes unused every day. I know, because my co-founder and I are former salon owners, and this was just the problem we were trying to solve for ourselves. Hi, my name is Courtney Caldwell, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Shearshare. Shearshare is the first B2B mobile platform that connects salon and barbershop owners to individual stylists to fill their empty salon space by the day. Back in 2012, we expanded our salon and found that stylists weren't looking to rent our space long term. Instead, we started to receive phone calls to rent out our suites by the day. Now why this is so very odd is because since 1916, the way that stylists find professional space to work hasn't changed. You cold call until you find a home salon, sign a long-term contract, and then work out of that same chair for one, five, ten years or more. But we decided to give it a whirl and soon found ourselves manually matching stylists to empty salon space for three years before we looked for a solution, couldn't find one, and decided to build out the technology ourselves. Here's how it works. You type in a city and hit go. You select your day or days of the week you'd like to work, license specialty, workspace type, and a whole host of amenities like free Wi-Fi and parking, cable TV, wheelchair accessibility, the list goes on. Once you find a match, you type in your credit card information and literally book salon space like you book a hotel room. It's that easy. By the way, Shear shares not just for hairstylists and barbers. Every licensed specialty within cosmetology finds space to work on the Shearshare app. Nail technicians, estheticians, makeup artists, massage therapists. And today, we're pleased to announce that Shearshare has listings across 375 cities and 11 countries. By the way, we've also signed on to do a pilot program with L'Oreal, the worldwide leader in beauty. But this is just the beginning. There's a seismic shift happening in our industry. The good thing is that Shearshare is already head of the revolution. More stylists are choosing to become independent contractors, 
70% in fact. Stylists are increasingly becoming location agnostic, choosing to build their personal brands on Instagram and YouTube. More importantly, no matter how independent the stylist, they will tell you that the salon is where they do their best work because this is where they were classically trained. In the same way that Uber and Lyft served as the intermediary between the drivers and the passengers and today are completely revolutionizing an entire transportation and logistics industry, Shearshare will be that for beauty. We launched our beta in September 2016 and since then have been growing 20% month over month. Stylists love us once they find us. We know this because 68% of these solopreneurs come back. Empty salon space accounts for about $16.9 billion every single year. That's opportunity revenue loss. The average share share price is $98 a chair per day. Bless you. <laughs> and because we take a 25% commission on each share share booking, our total estimated revenues over the next three years is north of $700 million. My co-founder has 25 years in beauty, earned his doctorate degree in professional barbering and cosmetology, and is a number one best-selling author on how to achieve long-term success in the beauty and style industry. My background is 20 years in B2B technology marketing. I used to run Oracle's digital strategy and innovations group worldwide and had P&L across five continents. Our head of product has engineering degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and has exited multiple marketplace startups right here in the Valley. We are proud YC fellow and 500 startups alums and are the perfect combination to execute in this billion dollar market. Sheer Share, our app is the first of its kind that lets stylists book space to work by the day in cities all over the world. We're growing 20% month over month, 68% of users rebook, and our strategic partnership with L'Oreal will help us define the future of work for the salon industry worldwide. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite to the stage my co-founder and CEO, Dr. Ty Caldwell. <laughs> um, hi guys. Hi. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the partnership with L'Oreal and what the opportunity for partnering with brands like that looks like? That's great. Great question. So we've actually just signed a, a mutual NDA. So what we can share is that how we're thinking about the Shear Share ecosystem is today we are empty space, fill a space, right? Um, but we're building trust with our stylists because we sit at the very beginning of the stylist life cycle. Um, eventually, what we want to do is provide resources, access to products, retail sale through, things like insurance. Um, the world is our oyster. And the, the wonderful thing about L'Oreal is that they're global. They have 33 wonderful brands that sweep all licensing uh, specialties. And we're looking to do a right time, right place ecosystem, if I can say that, um, that encompasses the sheer share users. The product land is changing with products and manufacturing distributors. Yeah. So they want to use this trust that we have now building with the independent stylists because not only are the brick and mortar businesses, because of social media, all the stylists, barbers, and all the beauty, beauty professionals, their business as well. So yeah. we, we partner with them for that reason. Yeah. Very well done. Um, my question is about the marketplace dynamic mm -hmm. and what is the ratio you think you need on the, mm. on the space and the, the stylist side to yeah. make sure that you're gonna be able to keep growing? And what have you learned from Uber Lyft related uh -huh. to uh, how how you're going to be create the kind of workplace you want to create yes. for these stylists. That's great. Um, so by design, we actually thought we were going to launch in three cities. <laughs> Unbeknownst to us, we started getting phone calls from stylists saying, hey, I'm going to be back home in Omaha, Nebraska next month. We have to travel back home to Pembroke Pines, Florida for Christmas, and I, I need salon space to rent by the day. So we were literally serving as a concierge service for a few years. Uh, we looked at our data, and thank goodness for data. Uh, we are a little bit of data nerds. And so we looked at where our top markets were. And so we're really focused now on one singular city that's the goal once we get this funding uh, complete is to focus down on one particular city so that we can build those network effects that's something we've definitely learned you haven't seen them yet. no I wouldn't say we've seen I don't feel comfortable saying that we have yet yeah still early so you convinced me there's definitely a problem for the perspective of the barber shops right mm -hmm. they have a lot of open space that's not being used yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the dynamic from the other side of the marketplace you mentioned stylists traveling to other cities mm -hmm. but Outside of that, does an average stylist look at a potential business opportunity or clients that they want to service 
And, and is it really actually hard for them to find places to do their work? <laughs> you know what, that's a great question. Being in the industry for 25 years, salon owner for two decades, we, ha we have had three ways that you can work at a salon. Either you're an employee-based, commission-based, or you're salary-based. So you couldn't just walk in a salon and say, I just want to work here for a couple of days yeah. because mm -hmm. you got to be a part of the team. Mm -hmm. you got to you got to really connect with the culture. And salon owners and barbershop owners wouldn't do that. So that space just went empty and dormant and it was just collecting dust over dollars. Yeah. And so our, our user, our typical user is female hairstylist, has over two years of experience, mm -hmm. um, and they like to travel locally. So it may be in the state of Texas, so they go from San Antonio to Austin to Dallas to, you know, San Marcos. Um, <laughs> But they love to build clientele in new cities, and this way with ShareShare, they never have to lose a customer as well. Yes, exactly. Great. Thank you. This Thank you, guys. And now, from Detroit, please welcome Mike from BankJoy. America's community banks and credit unions are struggling. They're under fire. But you probably already know that. But here's something you probably don't know. Credit unions in America serve more than 100 million people across communities in our nation. People love credit unions. They're built in our communities. They serve our communities. People trust credit unions to do their banking. But they have a big problem. Their apps, their mobile banking, their technology is terrible. And that, that's a big problem. And we solve that problem. We provide modern mobile and online banking that is beautiful and has the most advanced features, banking functionality that comes out of the box. And a bank or credit union, no matter how small or big, they can have one of the most advanced banking products for the cost of one developer per year, as little as that. But building technology like this is not easy. There are legacy systems that you need to integrate into. We're masters of that. But building relationships with banks and credit unions is equally hard. And for that reason, we've opened up our banking API so that FinTech developers can bring innovative and amazing technology to banks and credit unions and access millions of consumers who already trust these financial institutions. Our API strips away the complexity of banking legacy systems and surfaces functionality that FinTech developers haven't had before. Money movements, loan origination, new account opening. There's so many things that our API can do and we're adding to it every single day. And you can't achieve this by scraping websites. This is a deep and tight integration with banking legacy systems, and our team is masterful at that. But what good is a banking API if you don't have any traction, if you don't have any banks or credit units who are using it? We have 240 banks or credit units who have signed up for our banking API and our products. We have 12 who are live right now. You can open up your laptops and you can begin writing FinTech applications for Coca-Cola Credit Union and for Safe America here in the valley. And we do have FinTech developers who are creating immense value and bringing exciting and innovative technologies to credit units right now. Technologies that the big banks don't even have yet. Robo savings helps you achieve goals, whether you're buying a car or a new house or a trip to Paris, analyzes your transactions and moves money automatically. They're using your API for that. We have AI-based voice UI and chatbot technology that's beautiful, lets you talk to your money and understand it at a level that simple transaction histories won't let you do. That's being built right now by developers and it's taking days, not weeks, not months, not years, days. Because once you write to our API, once, it's universal and you can plug in anywhere in no time. We have $2 million in ARR that's already booked. Right now, we're realizing $500,000 more than that every year. And this wasn't easy to build. We've got a great team. We've got Scott Selinger in the audience, who is a veteran in our industry with more than 20 years of experience working with some of the top companies in the space.
from Jack Henry. It's a correlation. We have Luke and Chris, amazing fintech experience. Myself, I'm a former credit union executive. And Weiwei, graduate of USTC, the MIT of China. We're raising $1 million. We've got some great backers. And we've got $600,000 that's already circled. Love to talk to you. Thank you. So could you talk a little bit about how bespoke the interaction with the individual banks is? Does it take a fair amount of work for them to onboard the platform? How easy it, is it? How much, you know, how much time, how many man hours are you putting into actually onboarding the product for your customers? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we actually spent, we, we um, um, did a lot of the work up front, and we integrated with some of those popular systems. We have four, four core systems integrations right now. Core system is probably... Um, the, the biggest integration that you can do in this industry. We've got five of them already. Uh, we were integrating with some of the most popular bill pay, check processing systems, um, and other systems as well. So now when we onboard new clients, we're, we're literally talking days because we deliberately built our technology so we can quickly brand it and deploy it within a matter of days. Excellent. Um, of the 12 partners that you already have live, do you have any quantifiable results on how you've impacted them, either through additional revenue or interactions, engagement? What's happening with them? Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful question. We do have, we do see a lot more traction, especially with the digital banking channels. In some cases, 50% increases in, in, in terms of the adoption that's being seen right now by some of our credit unions, um, just because the products they had before weren't good enough, and people still had to go into a, a bank branch to, uh, to do their business. But now they can do everything from, uh, from mobile or online banking, and uh, they can download the app, and they can block their card if they lose it when they're out one night. Um, so we provide a lot of advanced functionality, and we're seeing a lot of adoption as a result of that. Um, can you walk me through what the switching cost is between what they're using now versus Bank Joy? And then is there high, low, medium switching cost between Bank Joy and moving on to something else? Because we're, we're really efficient at deploying our software, um, our costs um, are very competitive with the market. In some cases, uh, a credit or bank might actually be saving money by using our products instead of, you know, a Fiserv or another uh, big vendor. Um, we, again, we, we deliver, deliberately built the software so we could deploy it super fast. Um, that means that, you know, we don't need a lot of resources to deploy it. Um, a good example of that, we have a team of five. Uh, we did three installs a few weeks ago, three different credit units across the nation at 9 a.m. and turned them all on, boom, boom, boom. And, um, you know, we, we can do that all day now. So it's, it's super effective um, and not very cost, uh, costly for the credit or bank. Is it difficult for the, for the credit union or bank to switch from what they're using now to BankJoy? like those big kind of clunky legacy systems? How difficult is that? It's, uh, so uh, we've, we've been through this uh, 12 times already. Um, so we, we've got this process down pat now. We've got a really good uh, project management system in which uh, we convert them off. Um, you know, so we know exactly how to move credentials over or if we need to do like a brand new enrollment process um, to make it the, the transition, tr transition easy. Um, probably the most complex part is, uh, is just uh, you know, like picking a date and uh, the advertising and the marketing component of letting members and customers know that a new product is coming. But from the technology aspect, uh, we're really, really good at um, deploying that software to banks and credit unions and making that transition for them. We have a playbook for it. And now from Chicago, please welcome Heather from Genevity. Hello everyone, my name is Heather Holmes and I am the CEO and founder of Genevity. Genevity stands for Generations and Longevity and we're here to make sure that you and your loved ones don't run out of money in retirement. So unforeseen medical and health and elder care expenses is one of the top causes of bankruptcy in retirement and also 70% of us, so almost all of us in the room, are going to need some form of elder care that we haven't been properly planning for. And with 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every day right now, this is compounding into a massive, massive problem. And unfortunately, we are very unprepared and unequipped with the information that we need to make these decisions. And that's where Genevity comes in. That's the problem that we solve. 
We are a B2B SaaS platform that sells to financial professionals and helping them help families do two th or three key things. The first is that we help the family and that advisor protect the family assets based on health risk. So the first time, personalized information and data there. The second key thing that we do is we help strengthen relationships between the spouses and their adult children because you really want to make sure that they're all communicating and they're all on the same page and they're on, on the same plan. And finally, what we do is we help engage the next generation long before crisis mode. And this is important not just for the family, but also for those fin financial advisors because they're in some serious trouble. And if they, tr they traditionally, if they wait until the funeral of their main client to start engaging the family, that's too late. They lose the account, the numbers are staggering. And as an entrepreneur, when I saw those numbers, that screamed, screamed opportunity for us. And so what Genevity helps them do is be able to connect not just on how do you connect on plan on for the wealth, but how do you plan for the family's well-being and show that you care. And so our first product, HALO, stands for Health Analysis and Longevity Optimizer. So this is our proprietary technology that assesses the client on their health, their um, longevity, and their elder care risks, and then helps you understand how if you make changes today, how that helps increase your healthy years and reduces costs later in life. And then we bring the whole family into the plan I mean, we bring the whole family into the plan um, together with our, our full engagement platform, which really helps the family start to understand shared financial and health behaviors and traits and be able to understand through our intelligence and recommendations how they can spend less on health care, how they can live longer and better, and ultimately how can you start or can you worry less about making sure that your loved one is taken care of. Our traction to date, we are in market and working with advisors and firms. Um, we are going to be going live with a top 15 global bank very, very shortly here, and also with a Fortune 500 financial management, asset management group very shortly here. Um, additionally, we've worked really well with a lot of families. We know that they love what we do, and our pipeline is incredibly robust on the enterprise level. So the team behind this, we couldn't do it without uh, the people who stand behind us. So my co-founder, who you'll get a chance to meet shortly, Dr. Emily Chang, did her PhD and postdoc at Stanford. Her postdoc was in computational genetics before she went to 23andMe and worked on the health side. She's the brains behind our algorithms. I come from the other side of the healthcare industry, working in sales, but most of my career in market development. So it's the principles that I did there that have taken into what we do with Genevity today. And the rest of our team is a mix of financial services experts and technology experts who know what they're doing here. And of course, we are backed by some fantastic advisors, uh, uh, advisors in the financial services space. So why Genevity? We really are the first place out there that is bringing this unique connection of wealth, health, and family together in one place so you no longer have to choose how you want to plan. Our team is proven and we have patents behind it. But ultimately, this is about investment in your future because this is about you and your loved ones and protecting those ones that you love. So that's part of why you should be here and thinking with Genevity. So thank you very much. Oh, and I'd like to introduce my co-founder, Dr. Emily Chang, and have her come join, join me on the stage here. So thanks, Heather. And one question I have, I guess, is, is could you talk a little bit about some of the interactions between your customers and their clients? Because I worry that if I sit down with my financial advisor and they say, hey, by the way, JD, if you lost 10 pounds, you're likely to die less soon, then I might not react super well. That's not the sort of advice I want from that particular person. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So the first thing is well, we uh, spend a lot of time making sure that the experience is non-judgmental and does not make you feel that way. We take you where you're at and show you how it looks today. But then if you want to see how you can improve, we show you, if you make those changes, how that actually impacts things. So it's taking it from the positive. The second is that um, we provide all that information so that the advisor gets the data that they need to put into the financial plan, but does, is not diving into with you about your weight or you know, your exercise or those sort of things. And how do the customers react to it? Are, are, do they seem to be positively inclined? What's that relationship like? 
Yeah, so um, so five of the seven top concerns of pre-retirees are all health-related, worrying about how am I going to pay for health care, am I going to have enough money to cover that in retirement, and with all these changes that are happening right now, it's a pretty scary time. So people are out there searching, trying to find the information, and what's been fascinating for us coming from healthcare care into financial services is that advisors have not had any personalized way to bring in this data and numbers for their clients. They're using just um, generic averages for, for you and you and everybody here in the room. And I mean, why are we not using technology and personalizing it to you? Uh, when you say that you've been used by 31,000 families, can you explain to me what product use is of that? Because it's a staggering number. So can you just explain? Um, yeah, so um, so our, we have two products. Our other product is called Genevity Family. And so that's where we really started building out our algorithms and the, the thoughts behind what we were doing. And so we worked on a consumer model helping to make sure that families loved it and then took it into financial services. And we'll be doing a proper launch of that probably at the end of this year. Right now, um, that's how it, it works. Sorry, so that means that they, they just logged on, entered some information, got up some info on the on the on a dashboard. Is that what that product was, the Genevity family? So what we created was an interactive experience for the family tied around family history and genealogy. And then we fill in and we help them see patterns around health behavior and financial traits so that they do that. And then what it happens is they start going through these different quizzes and assessments that we do with them. They realize they don't have the information so they start involving other family members. Um, what's the sales process like for getting a financial services professional um, to start using this product? And w what kind of pushback or, or they're getting sold a lot. Um, there are a lot of products on the market for financial service providers. So what is different about yours and what's the thing that gets them to actually kind of purchase? Yeah, so the um, the great thing is the whole industry has been shifting in this dramatic way with the competition of robo-advisors and all this other things happening in technology. They have to show that they have a stronger relationship in the family than just managing assets. So there's this huge shift about how do we talk about health and there's a big open space for the opportunity of where we fit, where we came and fit in. So this is something that they're looking for and that they've been coming to us. But it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's our process. <laughs>
is to apply multiple times in the growing season because we can and it's easy. In sync with the needs of the plant, we believe we'll deliver net profits to the farmer up to $75 per acre, which is massive for a commodity farmer. And we should be able to limit off-field losses by up to 30%. We do this by reaching the farmer through channel partners. We're working with Growmark, the number three retailer of ag chemical and seed in the US. We'll pull in the sales data, combine it with other data layers, and figure out how much and when to apply. We'll deploy a system to a field, a couple of machines, and a recharge station. We'll return in 24 hours when that field is finished and move it on to the next field. This is the machine out in the field. You can see on the right how it moves between rows. Consider it a self-driving tank on wheels. So moving to a video to show how it looks in real life, moving into position to do work on real fields between rows. You can see it moving uh, and be in a great position to collect interesting data. How is this possible? Well, it's our team. I founded the business with my two brothers. Charlie on the left is a large scale, went on to be a large scale farmer. We all grew up farming. John is one of the world's foremost robotics experts. He most recently built Uber's self-driving car unit from the first employee up. Brian, our CTO, who's here with me today, is, a, is an exceptional roboticist. He, de um, he developed this robot for the Army, a $40 million commercialization project, first of its kind for the Army to detect mines and IEDs. Uh, and he developed our first system. We have a partnership with Carnegie Robotics that's very exciting. We're going to market as a service. We intend to have 2,000 machines in the market by 2022, each generating $30,000 of net profit by, at scale. I'm excited to take your questions. We are raising a round. I encourage you to join the robot revolution. Thank you. I'm new to the ag tech uh, industry, but um, can you kind of lay it out for me? What's your key competition? I feel like I've heard this kind of thing before, and then are you, do you already have the deals in place now that are gonna get you those 2,000 in the field so that you can kind of begin to lock up the market before 2022? Okay, so the first part of the question, um, there is competition. It's largely legacy equipment. There's nobody else trying to go at the between row robotic doing work on big fields uh, in corn. So when it's the legacy equipment, yes, there are these very large machines that can straddle the crop. The best farmers have figured out how to use it, but the market penetration is relatively low. They're generally used for other jobs and adapted to apply fertilizer later in the season. There is another set of equipment that can be dragged behind a tractor. The, the risk there is that if you're planning to use that equipment when the corn is low, but it starts raining when the corn is here, when you can next get on the field, the corn may be here, so you're scrambling for a new solution. That's left the majority of farmers to sit on the sidelines, apply fertilizer earlier. Uh, to answer the market demand, so we, we feel that we have uh, demand that meets our 2019 capacity. Um, we have lots of excitement from channel partners. These have been sort of one meeting signups to work with these channel partners. We have an LOI in place with Growmark so they're very eager. They have hundreds of locations across the Corn Belt. So as we, uh, farmers pretty much work all the same way, whether they're at a channel partner level or down, they wanna try it out on a few acres and then add it to more and more acreage uh, over time. So it works well with our deployment scheme. Can you talk a little bit about the value proposition for the farmers? So will this increase yields? Will this be much cheaper for them? What do they get out of this exchange? There, there are a bunch of ways to look at it from we, we uh, free them up to do other jobs during the a busy time of the season, but ultimately it comes down to we believe by timing the nitrogen application in sync with the crop, we'll be able to tune that and drive yield higher on good years. Uh, we'll also be able to conserve this very expensive input. So after buying seed, nitrogen fertilizer is the next most expensive input for corn farmers, and estimates are that 30, 40% of that is simply wasted, which creates the environmental downside. And there's tons of pressure on the ag sector to get their 
get their house in order before they get regulated, as the Chesapeake Bay watershed is. So we want to we want to be the good guys. We want to help them make money and solve their problem at the same time. Is it only corn? So we are completely focused on corn. Uh, the good news there is it's a massive market, uh, but we're essentially building the Lego blocks you could think of for autonomous systems that we could adapt, reassemble. Uh, very importantly, we did not get into business to bring robotics to agriculture. We started out to solve this massive problem in the Corn Belt. We backed into a robotic solution. Fortunately, we had the family connections to make it work. Um, when we move to the next crop, we want to make sure we're starting with the challenge at hand rather than saying, hey, we've got a hammer, where's the nail? And now, please welcome from Los Angeles, Derek from Ampit. Tech doesn't get content, and content doesn't get tech. Tech people think that it's all about the platform, but most brands don't want their ads running next to just every crappy video. Content people don't even know who's watching their stuff, mostly because the tech guys won't tell them. I know this from experience. I actually started out when I was doing my PhD research at Harvard in a band. And that band charted in my home country of Ghana right after Beyonce, went on to reach 100 million people around the world. And then at the end of it realized we had no idea who any of them were. And neither did Beyonce. <laughs> when the biggest bands on the planet, the biggest creators, don't know their audience, there's an opportunity. And so we built our dream team. It's an Ivy League educated squad, mostly Harvard folks, Couple of Yaleys for diversity. <laughs> Our CTO is a PhD computer scientist, formerly of LinkedIn. We have the former head of 20th Century Fox Music, as well as the executive producer of The West Wing and 24. I myself have worked with Oprah and Steven Spielberg and built interactive content properties that have reached over 300 million households around the world. And together we created Ampit. Think of it as YouTube 2.0 the first 21st century media company, combining TV quality programming with the interactivity of social media. Amazon and Netflix are amazing, love the content. Not a lot of interactivity. Facebook and YouTube, super social, quality control is limited. None of them connects the creator directly with their audience. And it gives you deep interactivity, real quality content professionally and fan curated, as well as tells the content owner who's watching and why, so that they can own the relationship with their audience. Every profile on Ampit, every piece of content has right next to it who the top fans are of that video, of that artist, of that filmmaker. Imagine you're a kid, you love Kim Kardashian. You go to the profile, you see Kim right there, and then next to her is your face, and she sees it too. This makes the fans very happy. And happy fans drive results. The typical social media app has two and a half minute user sessions. Ampit drives 30 minute user sessions. Our go to market, we built and tested the platform. We're taking seed content plus telecom partners to generate a network effect. We're gonna leverage that network effect to become a go to for major brands. The first seed property is called the World Cup of Hip Hop. It's already generated 20 million media impressions with no marketing spend, back-to-back -back Emmy nods for outstanding interactive program. We lost to Taylor Swift, I'm still trying to shake it off. <laughs> the 30 minute user sessions we're talking about are for this project and we got five times the ROI of a Super Bowl ad. The first telecom partner is Africa's largest, MTN reaching 250 million people across the continent. We're also partnering with Nat Geo, we're in talks with them right now to harness their billion people reach around the world, half of those people they reach via social media, and we're collaborating with the United Nations to hit young people on the ground wherever we work. We also have significant brands already in the pipeline because of that reach. You take massive reach plus major brands together and we can scale revenues rapidly, initially from brand sponsorship and then from scale at scale platform revenues. We built all of this with $400,000 for the platform. 
and then a million dollar investment in the content. We've got three million committed from the first telecom partner. We're raising 1.5 to take advantage of the opportunity. We're building the future of media, and we invite you to join us. Preguntas, por favor. How does it explain the Beyonce problem again? So, this is a great question. I actually give you a specific artist I know, a producer did a project with Lady Gaga. They got something like 10 or 20 million views on YouTube. They came to release the next project. We're sitting there talking to them. What's the big problem? Well, we don't have an audience. Like, well, how, how do you don't have an audience? You just got 10 million views. Like, yeah, but we don't know how to reach those people. See, typically what's happened is we push everything out, we broadcast, but these techno platforms are not giving us a way to directly connect back to the audience. So nobody owns their audience. They actually rent their audience from Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. So what Ampit does is it makes it so that you can actually tell who's driving the most engagement with any given piece of content in real time. And you know directly your fans. And then how does a content creator continue to communicate with that, with that fan and continue that relationship? Can you walk us through that? So you can do that exactly through the platform. If you do a campaign with us, that fans can opt into it. One of the important things we've done is make sure we protect the user's PII, the personally identifiable information. So a user has to opt in before we tell you exactly who they are. If they've opted into your campaign, at the end of it, you walk away with the database. That relationship is yours forever. The reason why people, we believe, will stay with the platform is because we keep the real-time analytics on how they're engaging, who's engaging, and that continues to shift. So the big challenge with lots of content platforms is the cost of content. Talk to, you've already spent $1 million on content, which for a startup is a lot. Tell me how you're going to control cost of content, and tell me how you're planning on acquiring more content, which is what keeps people coming back. I think that's a wonderful question. So the big way to control the cost of the content is actually to have other content creators come on board. And one of the significant problems, if you talk to people, for example, in Hollywood right now, everyone is like, oh, Netflix is the best thing since sliced bread. But if you talk to serious producers, they're like, well, yeah, but we don't know what our viewership is, so we can't get paid more if it's successful. We think that if you have a platform that can get actual real serious creators to know and be able to connect with their audience, you can have quality content being produced by other parties. So for example, what we're doing in Africa is a partnership to build the African cup of hip hop. From that, we can also connect with lots of different creators on the ground who also want to own their audiences there. The best way to lower the price of content is not to produce all of it ourselves. And is the, sorry, is the business model subscription or advertising or something else? Initially, it's sponsorship and advertising, and there will also be the ability to subscribe to have what we think of as like a Bloomberg terminal for media. We have real-time analytics on what's happening with people that you're interested in around the world. Thank you. And now, from Buenos Aires, please welcome Sebastian from Increase. Talent is absolutely universal. Opportunities too. Opportunities don't happen just in San Francisco. We are a very powerful and talented team based in Argentina. And I want all of you to put for five minutes in the shoes of a guitar business owner anywhere in Latin America. Joseph Visa. Joseph MasterCard, American Express, and because you are in Latin America, you accept many other credit cards. For cardholders, it's extremely easy. They go, they pick a guitar, they pay, and that's all. For you, it's a nightmare. And that is exactly how you finish your day, every day. And that is not the only problem. 
every single transaction has different payment schedules. In Argentina, they go from 48 hours to 30 days. In Brazil, they go from 48 hours to a year. So imagine waiting one year to receive the full payment of the guitar that you just sold. And that is not the only problem, again. Every transaction has dozens of different discounts. So you don't know how much you're gonna receive. From tax retentions, withholdings, chargebacks, bank promotions. You are running your business completely out of visibility of your cash flow. We are empowering businesses. We are truly empowering businesses. How we do it? We have connected to most of the credit cards, to Mercado Pago and to other sources of income, and all the information flows seamlessly into just one platform that helps business owners to control, reconcile, and integrate all their information directly to the different ERPs, if they have it. If not, if not increase, it's just enough for what they need. They pay $19 per month per point of sales connected. 70% of our business owners are small. They probably have just one guitar store. But we also serve Shell, Despegar, Latam, some of the biggest corporations in Argentina. We started selling in Greece three years ago. We went from zero to 20,000 point of sales connected. Company is cash positive and our churn is less than 1%. If I add a picture of how it's gonna look by the end of this year, it's gonna be reaching 50,000 business owners. And that is 10% of business owners in Argentina. But we have the responsibility to take increase to the whole continent. All business owners need to have visibility and control over their transactions. Banco del Progreso just invested one million in increase and we are taking the solution to Dominic Republic. We are working with Visa to launch Uruguay and Peru. And we just signed a contract with Pichincha to bring increase to Ecuador. We have been recognized by many great organizations. Being here is an honor. All of this has been done with $750,000 that we raised in 2015. We are now raising 3 million and 80% has been confirmed. I'm here not for the 20% remaining. I'm here to truly build long time lasting relationship with investors that truly want to impact in the life of business owners in Latin America. My name is Sebastian, CEO of Increase, and I welcome your questions. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, it seems like uh, your small business acquisition efforts are really going to be your key driver of success, uh, but these are small fragmented businesses. How much does it cost you to go bring on one of these businesses and what's the lead time? We have two strategies. We work with telcos that acquire businesses for us and the cost of acquisition is uh, between 20 and 30%. And we work with banks who started selling increase last year in Argentina and we have a dedicated team of five people. Our cost is 17% of the first month to acquire these merchants. Can you talk just a little bit about the customer experience? So if I'm using Increase as a merchant, what does that look like? It will have changed your life completely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I, I can take you through the journey, but <laughs> I, I, I just mean—I mean—is is, it—is it they're swiping a card on an iPad? What, what, what's the actual product? Just Good. trying to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, we are not processing payments at the moment. We have built a layer that is connected to the different credit cards, and after each transaction was approved or rejected, we receive the information, and we put together all the information so they can see all the 
uh, all the statements and transactions in just one platform, and they don't have to go to Visa, American Express, or MasterCard. In the future, we may start processing payments to give the history of the whole transaction from the point of sales to the reconciliation. And so how much of the business is built on the channel relationships with the visas and MasterCards versus the merchants themselves? Could you walk us through that, that exchange? We started working with uh, credit cards last year after we reached 15 or 16,000 business owners. They are not selling the product. They have, we are working with them for integrations because how the technology works made their systems sometimes almost collapse. So we have been working with them to improve the technology to keep serving our business owners. So to expand to new countries, you find a banking partner in that country and then expand through that banking partner. Um, are there, the languages are generally the same because it's all Latin America that you're doing the expansion in, but are there differences in business practices, culture across those borders that make it difficult or um, create some challenges in expansion and what are they? Yeah, there are many differences from different payment schedules to different discounts for the transaction. So the system needs to understand all the logic. That <laughs> I will take it uh, after, thanks. And now from Waterloo, Ontario, please welcome James from Skywatch. Good morning. Uh, some people call me the Space Cowboy, and others call me the CEO of Skywatch. Large organizations have long used satellites to study our planet. But we're entering a new world where the cost of putting a satellite into space is now accessible to a startup. Imagine the entire planet covered in sensors, capturing petabytes of information across the electromagnetic spectrum. This massive trove of data from space will eventually change the society in which we live in. However, leveraging this data has historically been very challenging. There are a litany of data sources, costs, regulations, and formats to deal with. As a beginner, I am forced to deal with satellite operators to come up with custom business and technical solutions, investing tens of thousands of dollars before I've even realized the value proposition. We started Skywatch to answer one simple question. What if you could easily and affordably analyze anything from space any day? The Skywatch platform aggregates disparate sensor data from space and converts it into information that's easy to leverage. To our users, we're an abstraction layer to the complex satellite ecosystem. Through a very simple API, we enable developers to easily build integrations using satellite data in just a matter of minutes. For comparison, think about what Twilio has done for communications data, or think about what Stripe has done for online payments. So to satellite operators, we're a low touch high margin, high volume path to market. So what does a Skywatch future really look like? Imagine a smart water sprinkler system using satellite data as the input that determines when and how to water crop. Or IoT devices on an oil pipeline that when triggered, send an immediate image to the disaster responders and the executives at that oil company. Or how about the world's most quantitative count of how many structures are being built every day in every city? Pricing on our platform is very simple. We have a per square kilometer uh, price point uh, set by the operator, and Skywatch has a 20 to 40% take rate of those transactions. Annual commercial satellite data sales are expected to grow to about $6.5 billion by 2023. 
So at an average take rate of about 30%, that provides annual revenue opportunities of about $2 billion in what is likely a winner-takes-all market. With zero outbound marketing or sales in, in our private beta, we've had over 3,000 companies sign up. We have now, right now have over 700 live API keys and applications being developed, representing 12 different industries. We're now focused on scaling the supply side integrations. We're currently negotiating uh, uh, partnerships with over 35 different satellite operators. Within six months, this will represent 40% of all imagery in the world being available on our platform, which will enable us to fulfill up to $1.5 million in monthly commercial sales. We have the perfect team to lead this evolution. Our team has built NASA award-winning software. We've taken satellite companies from the ground up to IPO, and we've built massive, some of the world's most massive petabyte-scale data systems. We're also backed by the leading investors in the space industry, as well as investors who have built large technical data platforms. And we're also some of the leading voices for the entrepreneurial space age. Thank you very much. Um, can you give a couple more examples of um, who, what type of companies are actually using this data and for what? Okay, so all three of those examples are examples of, of companies that are using our platform. I'll give you a, another recent example. So imagine a coffee producer, uh, one of the world's largest coffee producers. Uh, they source their beans from about 750 disparate farms across South America as well as in Africa. Um, they're trying to better understand and better model uh, the inputs they're going to get from a harvest season into their, so they can better understand what their outputs are going to be. They can better understand their expenses and then their revenue. They've tried drone imagery, so they tried it on one farm. They really liked the fact that they could get this data, but they didn't like the economics of it. It wasn't going to scale well to the rest of 750 farms. So there's an example of them now using satellite data to every three, or five, every three to five days getting new imagery um, from satellites built right into their um, supply management software so they can actually see per supplier what, the, like, what percentage of the crop that's currently being grown is actually healthy at that point, which feeds into a real-time model of what they think the input into their business is going to be that season. We also have um, asset tracking, so management tracking, people counting ships, counting cars, trying to understand um, retail performance, better predict revenues um, prior to a company actually uh, this, it, a lot of market intelligence uh, use cases as well. And anything, anything of which you want to do tra change detection, really great for. To the coffee bean farmer, how much does it cost them versus the drone? I mean, if that's the alternative. Uh, so in one case, it was about 90x less. So with a, with a drone, you have to actually have an operator, go to the, the, the location, fly it. Um, it's just an orbit, so there's no additional, the, the variable costs are just the bandwidth of taking the image and sending it down. And if you think about what a drone covers compared to a satellite image, um, you can fit about a thousand farms into one satellite image. Um, and and the, the cost there is just a, a few dollars to actually take the image and send it down to the ground station. What does the competitive landscape look like for your company? Um, the cost of satellites has gone down dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, what's stopping a competitor from getting into the space? What makes you different and better? And, mm -hmm. and where do you see your moat? So the way satellite operators have solved distribution to date or historically is they set up geography-based sales um, teams. And the process of actually acquiring data is very high touch. So if I'm in Southeast Asia, I call up the operator in Southeast Asia. We discuss what kind of data needs I have, and then eventually they'll make the data available either through FTP or, or, um, or a thumb drive even, depending on the scale. Um, I think apart from just technical um, innovation, what we've really brought to the industry is business model innovation. So we're really applying, uh, we're applying aggregation theory and saying that if we can actually provide an aggregator and focus on machine-to-machine -machine applications, we can vastly grow the market for, for, um, for this data source. Now, we're, we're the first to propose this bot, uh, business model innovation. So far, we've had a huge, huge uptake. Um, we anticipate people to, to now start competing. We, we have a uh, you know, few rumors out there that we know that there's a few people um, now kind of looking at what we're doing and realizing it's the most powerful to position to be in in the industry, <laughs> controlling distribution. So yeah, thank you. Great. And now, from Washington, D.C., please welcome Charles from Linked Senior. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Charles, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. We have a digital engagement platform for senior care, that is, assisted living and nursing home. Today we're doing 1 million in annual recurring revenue, and we're actually going to be cash flow positive in Q2. We're here to raise $3 million to grow even faster. And the good news is that we're actually expecting our first term sheet in the next 10 days. Now, let me ask you about your passion. What defines you? For me, I'm French. My wife and I have four kids. I love long distance running. And I believe that old people are really, really, really cool. <laughs> now, imagine a world where every data point that defines you, you cannot connect to that. Imagine that people didn't know anything about you, so could not help you. How would that make you feel? Bored? Lonely? Would you actually want to live that way? That world actually exists today. It's called senior care. The staff mostly use paper to engage residents. So there's almost no engagement, especially for people living with dementia, like Alzheimer's. You only get 11 minutes of engagement a day. It's the three Bs, bingo, Bible, and birthday. No surprise that most of the residents, 20% of the residents, are prescribed antipsychotic medication to manage agitation. At Link Senior, we're really passionate about fixing this by digitizing the workflow for engagement, which is simply engaging, assessing people, providing a personal engagement plan. In my case, providing French music, for example, and evaluating the program. This very virtuous circle, using AI and machine learning, helps us get better building our secret source so that ultimately we're making engagement part of the treatment. Our clients love us because not only can we help them engage all of their residents, but that produces outcomes, clinical outcomes that, are, that were actually validated Friday with the clinical studies preliminary results. These outcomes help them build better businesses. We have a 94% renewal rate on multi-year subscription contracts. We touched 35,000 lives in 42 states in Canada. We totally own our sales process, and every single data point shows that we should heavily invest in marketing and sales. Market is huge and is gonna explode given the aging population, our land and expand strategy as a vertical SaaS company, and reaching people at home to help them age in place. With me, I have an incredible team passionate about the aging experience. Our CTOs built three successful startups, and the rest of the team, part of my French, badass. <laughs> our advisors have built dominant platforms in senior care, and investors include owners and operators in the market. We're actually truly making a difference in people's lives. Actually, all, all of our lives, because we're all aging. This is why I'm on stage, and I invite you to join me. Thank you very much. And I'd like to invite Carrie, our VP of Growth, for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, where, where does this live? Is it at nursing homes, inside of care centers? Yeah, so our, our clients are the, the assisted living and the nursing homes, so it's used by the caregivers um, that interact with the older people. And, and what does it tell them? So if I'm a caregiver, what does the product do for me that I wouldn't otherwise be doing? Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm in charge of a like engaging you, like the audience, and you were my population, I would go to you one by one with a paper-based process to interview you or find out who you are, so up to 70 data points. That piece of paper goes in a drawer and is not really actionable. So one is that we collect the data and we help the people understand who are, for example, the crazy French people. Maybe we can put them together because they like to be with other French people. But the idea is to make that data actionable for engagement and so on. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 if if the elderly population in a given nursing home, let's say, 
if six of them like you know John Wayne movies, then your platform would give some insight into the caregiver so that they could put those people in the same room, provide social functions that might unite them. Is, is that basically what it's doing? Absolutely. Okay. And in addition to that, we do have content that the caregiver can actually use to deliver to who the, re the residents. And we also capture the tracking and engagement level so that, again, we can fine tune and we use that for the nursing homes for the regulatory uh, risk management, but also just to inform the family of what's being done for, for the older person. Um, nursing homes and assisted care facilities have been delivering care in the same way for a very long time. So how difficult is it for them to understand the value of using this platform and of changing the way that they're engaging with their patients? Yeah, great question, Monique. Um, like with any digitization of a process, like we're really picking up paper and, and moving to digital, there's a lot of value in just transparency and a way to manage that process. If you look at every department of these operations, activities and engagement is the only one remaining that's only paper driven. So there's actually, it's like nine and day after we come in within 90 days. I, just add, I would just add one more thing. Charles mentioned the study that uh, this third party research center just validated that our clinical outcomes actually exist. It's beyond anecdotal evidence at this point. So social isolation as well as aggressive behaviors related to dementia are two things that our clients really struggle with. That news came in on Friday, so we're excited to see the ways that that's gonna help our clients in the future. A lot of states are regulating now on reducing antipsychotics and social isolation. Who led that study? It's Baycrest. It's a, an institute in, in Toronto, Canada. Thank you very much. Good job, guys. Great, and now please welcome from New York City, Neha from Obsess. Hi everyone. At Obsess, we are building the store platform for the new generation of the web, the 3D 360 web. Consider the evolution of stores. Before the internet shopping came about, when you only had physical stores, they provided a very immersive and curated experience, and you felt the brand as soon as you walked into the store. But you had to go to a fixed location to shop. When the web came about, you could now shop from home, but the whole branded immersive experience was lost and replaced with a flat grid. Now on mobile, you can shop from anywhere, which is amazing, but you still have the same flat database experience. With the new generation of the web, which is enabled by virtual and augmented reality technologies, your phone is now your magic window into the world. It will let you see more and reveal more of the physical and digital world around you. And the e-commerce experience with this new technology can now take the best of the physical retail experience, enhance it with contextual and personalized shopping, and still have the convenience of doing it from anywhere. We want to be the platform that runs all online stores in this new web. Right now, you're going to experience it on your phones and in the future with glasses. We have an amazing team to take on this challenge. I got my graduate degree in computer science from MIT, was an engineer and tech lead at Google for five years, then led product and tech at an e-commerce startup, and then I was the head of product at Vogue for four years. I was the first tech person Vogue ever hired in their 120-year history, and I launched all their current digital properties. Our head of engineering is from Amazon and has machine learning and graphics experience, and we have two VR AR engineers and one 3D designer on the team. So why is the current e-com interface broken? Let me illustrate. So today, whether you're shopping for a $2,500 dress, or a $500 table, or a $5 toothpaste, the experience is identical. This interface was in fact invented by Amazon 20 years ago to sell books online. And now it's used to sell every product category, and it's used to sell every type of brand, leading to a completely undifferentiated experience. So compare this flat, tedious database experience with this powered by Obsess. We enable visual, immersive, beautiful online stores that are fully interactive. 
Our technology renders these stores using HD quality photorealistic computer graphics that all work right on the web, on your phone or your desktop. This is a highly engaging shopping experience that's bringing in context, discovery, visual merchandising, and brand identity into the shopping experience online for the first time. Since this entire experience is digitally generated and not based on static photography, our templates can be customized to any look and feel. So every brand and retailer can make the experience their own. This is a much bigger opportunity than search and filter-based e-commerce. We have had 118,000 in pilot revenue so far. We are now moving to a SaaS model and have booked 35,000 in revenue just in the last couple of weeks with brands that are going to make this their homepage experience. We were chosen by Walmart as the winner of a competition to find the best VR AR startups. Our initial target categories are fashion, home, and lifestyle. Fashion alone is a $2.4 trillion industry. And 20 years after the birth of e-commerce, only 20% of fashion sales happen online. So there's a massive opportunity to capture the emotional, the entertainment sale online. Also, e-commerce is expected to become the largest revenue stream across AR, VR within a few years. So to wrap up, our vision is to enable the most engaging form of shopping that's going to be better than physical retail and better than current e-commerce. Thank you. Um, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> How long does it take? What's the process for a new brand to come on and, and get their environment and their product up? Yeah. Um, so we have a few templates right now, and over time we will have more and we will optimize them because a part of our platform is also to collect data on every user interaction that happens in these environments. And in 3D, you can actually collect a lot more data than you can in 2D. So using that, we're going to continue optimizing the templates and the process will become faster and faster. Right now, it's pretty simple. The brands just have to provide us images of their products that they already have for e-commerce. Um, so it's a very easy integration process. They don't even have to change anything on their website. We host everything. They just have to point a domain to our page. And do you have any future thinking around um, customization, recognizing the customer when they yes. return, um, you know, understanding that I don't want to see flats, I only want to see heels, yeah. um, that sort of behavior? Yeah, absolutely. So that's part of the vision of the platform is that ultimately the store that you will see will be personalized to you. And that's, again, part of the data that we are collecting. And that that's already, we have all that data, like what people are looking at in these environments. Because that's where it can really change from the current store experience, which has to be obviously static for every person. Um, so over time, the stores will be dynamically generated for every user. So product looked really cool. And, and I guess my question is, do you have any sense of whether customers actually, whether that coolness, the slickness, the experience translates into better buying behavior from customers, or is it largely hypothetical at this point? Yeah, so I mean, for us, it's still early. But overall, in the industry, there's a couple of trends which lead us to believe that it will. One is that millennials and Gen Z consumers want experiences, not just information. And there's a lot of data around this. And today, e-commerce is just about information. So that's one point. The second is there's a lot of um, studies where many of the e-commerce brands that started online, when they open physical stores because of the immersive nature, the brand recall is much higher. And you actually see those effects over long periods of time in customer loyalty and LTV. Um, so we definitely expect that that's going to be the effect of having more immersive branded experience is more brand loyalty, more brand recall. Um, and we expect to have that data as we like launch more customers. Yeah, so ultimately the goal of all this is to increase sales and over the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So congratulations to the founders that just pitched on stage today. Please join me in a huge round of applause for all 11 startups. Great. 
So judges, we're going to head out to the room to deliberate on the judges' favorite. And I'd like to welcome Nicole Froker on stage from the partnerships team. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Froker, Partner Engagement Manager with Google for Entrepreneurs. While the judges are deliberating, I'd like to invite everyone here in the room, as well as on the live stream, to cast their vote for the Audience Choice Award. So please take out your phones and head to slido.com. Once you're there, enter hashtag Google Demo Day and select your pick for the winner. I'll give everyone a moment to do that. Great. At this time, I would like to invite one representative from each partner who has a startup pitching today to the stage to briefly introduce themselves and give one minute overview of their startup organization and how they support the ecosystem. So partners, would you please join me on the stage? Round of applause. <laughs> Dina, we'll start with you. Hey everyone, my name is Dina Siegel. I'm the manager of membership at 1871 Chicago, a member company here at Genevity. It was amazing to see them pitch. And 1871 is a nonprofit tech hub in Chicago, Illinois. We're home to about 500 high growth technology startups, about 1,500 members, all supported by an ecosystem geared towards accelerating their growth and creating jobs in the Chicagoland area. Uh, thrilled to be here today. Hey, I am Kyle Kolbroth, uh, founder and CEO of Fueled Collective, formerly Coco. Uh, we are a group of spaces that gather entrepreneurs, uh, investors, and uh, small businesses all into a space. Um, seven locations from Minneapolis to New York. And um, yeah, we do that by uh, gathering people together during the workday and socially in the evening to make it a, a safe place for uh, people changing the world to gather together. Good afternoon. My name is Doug Spate. I'm executive director for American Underground in Durham, North Carolina. Our company pitching today was Fathom AI. Um, we are a campus for entrepreneurs with over 273 companies, um, amazing startups. 32% uh, are led by female founders. Another 30% are led by founders of color. Um, so we focus in on diversity and inclusion uh, for a number of programs for Google and for, uh, for our region. Hi everyone, my name is Grace Andrews-Gevich and I am the VP of Programs at Aging 2.0. Um, Aging 2.0 is based here in San Francisco. We support innovators that are taking on the biggest challenges and opportunities in aging. So we're excited to be here today to support Linked Senior, who's part of our community. Hi, my name is Yuka. I am the president of Astia and we are leveling the playing field for women-led uh, women companies and gender inclusive teams with access to capital and expertise. We operate globally and our view is that we need to fix a pipeline to, uh, to capital rather than fixing the entrepreneurs because we are not broken. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is John Beadle and I'm a partner manager at Techstars. Techstars is a worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed and we do that through venture capital, uh, mentor-driven accelerators, and some of our early stage programs like Startup Week and Startup Week. So wherever you are on your entrepreneur journey, we would love to help, and we would like to congratulate uh, Obsess and Skywatch, who came from the Techstars Network as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Damien, um, CEO and founder of Grand Circus. Uh, we're a tech hub based in Detroit, Michigan, and I uh, just wanted to congratulate Bank Joy on a great pitch and the entire GFE team for another. This is our sixth demo day, and this is the best yet, so well done, guys. Um, Awesome stuff. So Grand Circus is a tech hub that does a few things. Um, we provide education, co-working and events. Um, we've been around for about five years and over that time we've trained around a thousand software developers um, and our community of startups is around 450 people now. And this is all in a part of Detroit that uh, is full of buildings that were empty and in ruin for about 30 years before uh, this community started. So it's a very exciting time in Detroit. If any of you are interested in coming to Detroit or you want to know more about it, just reach out and uh, happy to talk more. 
Hello, my name is Evan Clark. I'm an advisor and investor relations at Communitech. Communitech is a major tech hub and accelerator program in Waterloo, Ontario. We are 1,200 startups and technology companies strong. We build programs across the stages of companies, early, early stage validation, up to sales acceleration and large corporate partners. One of our programs I'm really proud of is our Fierce Founders Accelerator, which is a female exclusive accelerator for technology companies. Uh, if you look back at the data seven years ago, we were probably around 3% of, of co-founders were female. Now we're almost at one in three, which is an awesome uh, movement. And congratulations as well to your program for that. Um, if you're, I would invite you to come and see Waterloo. Make the trip up to Canada. If you're going to do it, come see it. Pick your time. Pick your season. Uh, I recommend coming the end of May, uh, where we both kick off patio season for those two weeks we have it, and uh, a major tech conference called True North, where we is a major tech uh, conversation about how technology is going to impact uh, the next generation of people and the planet. I'd love to chat with anybody interested in the Canadian ecosystem, so come chat. Awesome. Um, I'm Carly Krieger. I'm the VP of Marketing and Partnerships for Startup Grind. Um, we're based here in the Bay Area, but we have chapters in 350 cities, 120 countries worldwide. I think all of the cities here and many in Canada. Um, so we, um, we are on a mission to help support every entrepreneur in the world. Uh, we host events, monthly events around the world in these, in these chapters where we have a local ecosystem grown by the local chapter director. So if you haven't been to an event or tapped into that community, please do. Um, and uh, we're super happy to be here. Sheer Share was here from our community. Hi, I'm Rogelio Cuevas, head of Mexico City Hub Central. Um, we're very excited to have Unima pitching here today. They're coming actually from Guadalajara. That's where we opened our second location just this year. So we're very excited to have them here. And just like our, the rest of our colleagues, uh, we run a, a number of programs, and that's why that's how we foster the development of the startup ecosystem in Mexico. We partner with Google and with uh, Google Developers Launchpad, and that's like um, how we run like a, a number of programs, both in Mexico City and Guadalajara. We also run a number of events, and we have about 20 communities per each of, in in each hub, and that um, each communities like to. Um, basically like bring up the level of uh, proficiency in, the, in, in different coding languages. And we're also starting a, a coding academy and super excited to be part of the Google for Entrepreneurs Network. Thank you guys. Can you take your seats? Thank you. Great. So the judges will be announcing the winner soon, but in the meantime, we'd like to invite you all to get to know each other a little bit better. Underneath your seats, you will find a card with a prompt on it. Please turn to the person next to you, introduce yourselves, and ask them the question on the card. We'll direct your attention back to the stage in a few minutes when we have the winners selected. Thank you.
right. Thank you, everyone. As you can tell, it was a very hard deliberation. The judges went back and forth on a wide variety of um, comments. So thank you guys for um, your patience. Bradley and I are going to stand up here and announce the um, Audience Choice Award. Now is the time for our awards. Um, once again, please w welcome or join me in welcoming and congratulating these 11 teams that have been here. They did an amazing job. Okay, so all of you here and on the live stream have voted on Slido for the audience choice. So the award goes to. What did I say? No, you. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a mic. Oh, <laughs> sorry, Skywatch. Oh, James, come up here. Great. Space wins. Awesome. I like it. Great. Congratulations. All right. We'll do a photo yeah. for. Sky's not the limit. Right. Thank you so much, James. Thank you very much. Congrats. All right. Now I'd like to invite the judges back on stage. Uh, JD has it. Great. JD, I'll hand it over to you to announce our winners. Okay, great. So first of all, we had a, a pretty intense debate back there. We were really impressed with the quality of the entrepreneurs and the, the founders and the pitches. Now, Rise the Rest, which is the, the, the fund that I'm the managing partner at, we're really strong believers in the fact that entrepreneurship can exist everywhere, can have a positive effect anywhere. And so seeing these really high quality 11 companies from all over the world was really inspiring and really matched with our broader mission. But because we debated so uh, strongly, we, we couldn't quite come to just one decision. So we've actually selected two winners in this pitch competition. And one is Increase. And the second is Sheer Share. Oh, this. And and the second, by the way, was Sheer Share was our second our second winner. And so real quick before, uh, first of all, an honor to be with, with these guys up here. It was fun to judge with you. A couple of quick announcements from the Rise of the Rest Fund. So we're actually going to invest 250000 into Shear Share and into Increase. And also, this is, this is a bit of an Oprah, everybody gets a car moment, because we're, 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 we're going to issue a challenge to all the other presenters. If you can raise a million dollars in the next six months, we'll do 150 k into your company. So there's our challenge. Now go out and raise the money, and I'll turn it over to the other judges. Thank you. Um, so I think we're going to give a little bit of, of feedback and why we chose the companies that we chose. So I think that increase, we were really impressed with your attraction and, you know, we felt that in the time that you, in the time that you spent and the amount of money that you've raised, you came a really long way and um, that was incredibly impressive for us. Uh, and I, I do a lot of this, and there's not normally so much debate around the, the different companies, so there really was a, a great overall presence today. And the thing I think we couldn't step away from with ShareShare Share is just the quality of the team and how much we think that you guys are going to be able to execute. Yeah. Uh, and thank you all for coming out. <laughs> No, that's it. 
much. Thank yes. you. If you guys can hang out for a second, thank you all so much for joining us for our annual Google Demo Day. We're going to invite the partners that nominated these fabulous startups up to the stage for a few photos. Um, please join us again across the hall for a networking lunch. Make sure you stop at the booths to have one-on-ones with these fantastic startups. And if you have to run out, put your business card in the envelope so they can catch you. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you.